Welcome back to Kamikaze Overdrive MMA Predictions. As always, I am your host, Scott Johnson. And on this episode of the show, special episode, specially delayed, we are taking a look at the upcoming UFC Fight Night 132 event, which will emulate from Singapore uh, on June 23rd. Now, normally I do an intro and I talk up the fights or I talk up some major UFC event or MMA-related event. We don't have time for that because it is, what, Thursday already? And this is one of those weeks where I'm, you know, being a school teacher... I am absolutely swamped with marking exams, doing report cards, all of those things. In addition, to that, in addition to that, I have a couple other things I've had to take care of. And be, seeing as this is a kind of a, a, one of those low-level shows that's uh, going to be played at a very odd time because it's uh, coming from Singapore, I've opted to do just a, a show. I'm going to give you predictions for all the fights. I'm going to do all my preliminary predictions and my main card predictions here on the show. There won't be any preliminary picks posted at KamikazeOverdrive.net. And I highly doubt I'm going to do a bet pack. I, I post on Twitter they probably wasn't going to, and that most likely will be the case. Uh, but I'm still there's a possibility. So all I'm going to say to you is check out the website. If it's not there and I don't post a bet pack, which it'll be up, that bet pack will be up by Friday morning if it's going to be up. Uh, if that is the case, I don't post one. If you subscribed, you will get the next one, which is the Ultimate Fighter finale. Um, in July, you'll get that one for free, so don't despair. I'll look after you that way. Uh, but, hey, keep an eye. It could be up. I could find some time tonight to put it together because there are some interesting odds and some very bettable uh, options on this card, so it's certainly worth considering. Um, coming off a not-so-awesome show, it wasn't my best uh, best moments. It started okay, but things just fell apart. But, uh, yeah, let's see what we can do here. And, uh, again, I apologize for the delay. It's just been one of those weeks, and I recognize I had an opportunity with this card to... Uh, alleviate a little bit of stress by not pushing it but uh I, i've done some work i've got my prediction set up so let's take a look at that first preliminary prediction so as i said um in the intro i'm going to be working my way through the preliminary fights and giving you my predictions for all of them just a quick breakdown of what i think is going to happen again with this card there's a lot of lesser known fighters in the card got people that are debuting or only have one or two fights in the ufc and it's you know, one of those regional UFC events, if you want to call it that. Our opening fight of the night takes place in the uh, UFC, uh, sorry, fly or sorry, women's flyweight division as Melinda Fabian, four three and two, takes on G and I'm going to butcher a lot of names in this card. G Yeon Kim with a current record of seven wins, one loss, and two draws. Now Fabian, she fought Deanna Bennett to a draw on her debut. She was on the Ultimate Fighter uh, show when her division was being. Uh, Developed for Kim, she lost to Lucy Pudlova in her debut. She then moved to her more, more appropriate flyweight division and took a controversial upset over Justine Kish. I actually took Kim to win that fight. I thought it was close. I thought it was kind of messy and could have gone either way. And uh, I did. I did ultimately like the outcome of that matchup because I did pick up uh, Kim to win the fight. Um, it's interesting to note this fight: the fact that both are still relatively green. Both girls have actually fought Pudlova. Um, uh, as I said, Kim lost to her. Fabian lost a split decision earlier in her career, a little bit earlier in her career, so both a little bit experience there. But again, it's not much to go on for a fight like this. Uh, well, looking at Fabian first, she will trade. She can also look for takedowns if the situation is, presents itself. Um, she has had some issues as a uh, as uh, on on the mat. She was submitted pretty quickly in the Ultimate Fighter. She's also been submitted twice as a pro, so that's an avenue I expect to see Kim consider. Um, she does come from a kickboxing background. Her striking is a little bit erratic and stiff at times. She put up decent volume against Bennett. Uh, for Kim, she's more of a boxer. She's had some success, though, getting the fight to the floor and really overwhelming and grounding out her opponents, grinding out her opponents on the ground with some top position strikes that eventually led to the finish. Uh, well, Kim could stand with her and throw a very and use a very measured, you know, controlled, calculated striking attack to win this fight. I expect to see Kim try and get this fight to the ground. And uh, she does have three wins by submission, so certainly not out of the ordinary. And my prediction is Ji Yeon Kim to defeat Melinda Fabian by. Uh, we'll take it by submission, I think, in this fight. Uh, fight number two, and again, the order of this is a little bit up in the air, but fight number two, based on the UFC website, uh, Janelle Lausa takes on Alka Sasaki. Lausa coming with a record of 7-4-0. Oh. Sasaki, 20 wins, 5 losses, and 2 draws. And this fight, of course, transpiring in the UFC's flyweight division. Uh, what we have here, I would say, primarily is a striker versus grappler matchup. Lausa coming from a boxing background, a pro boxing background. He wants this fight to stay on the feet. Sasaki has proven time and time again he is at his best when he gets the fight on the floor and can grapple. Um, Alka has been fighting really good competition in uh, the UFC. You know, Juicy Formiga, Justin Scoggins, Wilson Hayes picking up the, the comeback win for Scoggins. You know, there's some pretty solid guys, solid little competition. He's beat the guys he should have. He's lost a couple close fights. He's lost some blowout fights. But yeah, for Lausa. 
he's had some issues with takedown defense. He's given up eight takedowns over three fights, which was absolutely as concerning against Saki. Saki doesn't have a, a really super strong wrestling game, but he has shown he can get the fight to the floor when needed, especially against guys who are on that lower level. Uh, we did see Laos take down Shelton, but again, I don't think that's something he's going to focus on here because he's going to recognize how good Sasaki is on the mat. Uh, if he does opt to go that route, he's probably going to get himself into trouble. You know, And again, Sasaki, he's been dealing with these elite-level grapplers where his, his forte not, is not necessarily his best route to victory, but in this fight, it absolutely is. Um, Sasaki has been stopped before and hurt in fights. Laos could, if he can stay vertical, could land some shots, put him down. But again, I'm not overly blown away by his striking. I like Sasaki to close that gap use the clinch, and eventually drag the fight to the ground with some trips or work his way to his back, probably by rear naked choke, I would think. And my prediction is Alka Sasaki to defeat Janelle Lausa by submission. Uh, fight number three on the card takes place in the, again, in the flyweight division as Danger Matt Schnell, 11 wins and 4 losses, takes on, and again, Naoki Inoue of Japan, undefeated at 11-0. Now, Schnell's coming off his best UFC performance by far, uh, defeating Marco Beltran by decision. It wasn't a barn burner of a fight, but he did enough to pick up the victory. Beltran fought very poorly in that matchup. Uh, for Inoue, he's coming off a debut victory. He's been out of action for just over a year. And again, for a younger fighter, the guy's very young. Was he 20 years old, right in that range, I believe? A year seems like a long time off, but it's a thing where you get that first fight under your belt, and then you start to hone your skills, and it, you you want to see those those leaps in capability from one fight to the next, and a year certainly opens the door for that potential for Inoue. Uh, both men have their biggest wins in the uh, submission category, and that's where I would think both guys would normally want uh, their fight to transpire. But Schnell, again, he's coming off that win where he didn't land any takedowns. And again, he fought very cautiously. He has been knocked out twice in the UFC, so you have to wonder if that's something that's on his mind. In a way, not exactly a big knockout threat, but hey, when you've got a guy like Schnell, who's a little bit chinny, and sp especially in a lighter weight class, you have to wonder if anybody can connect, can they put him down? Inoue's a very good grappler, very talented grappler. He was taken on a couple times in the last fight and made the ground exchanges absolutely hell for his opponent. Uh, does he have the rest to dictate what this fight goes to the floor? I don't know if he does or not, but I say he's certainly more durable, um, and I think he's going to make the mat game for Schnell completely undesirable and force him into a one-dimensional situation. On the feet, in a way, I think he'd use his reach and his volume to just to beat Schnell in the majority of the exchanges. Uh, but I think eventually Schnell's going to get the fight to the ground or go, go to the mat, make a mistake, because he's a kind of a submission over position guy too. And in a way, will capitalize. And my prediction is Naoki, in a way, to defeat Matt Schnell by... Um, I'll go by submission as well. Uh, now, another fight that I'm absolutely destined to uh, butcher the name takes place in the women's uh, strawweight division as uh, Vivienne Pahesh, uh 13 wins and one loss, takes on Yan... Uh, Chenoa, I'm not sure if I'm going to say that correctly, of China, coming with a record of eight wins, one loss, and one no contest. Now, Pahesh is a, is a very tough fighter. She can strike. She's durable. She's just an all-around tough nut to crack. She's got a solid jab. She has some good power. She ran into a very good ground fighter uh, in Suarez in her last matchup, and that is not a knock on her. That's just how good Suarez is. Uh, when she fought uh, Jamie Moyle, she landed 80 strikes overall in that fight. looked very good. She kept the fight standing, defended Moyle's takedown attempts, and that was key to her, key to victory in that fight. Now, for Jan, she took a decision for Kaylin Kern in her debut. Kern's really struggled since hitting the UFC level. Uh, she does have five wins by knocking in eight career victories, so she's got some pop in her hand. She's very aggressive. She'll want a brawl. Uh, she, she throws hard. She offers a heavy front kick, which will throw, see her throw down the middle there and really put some, do some damage to her opponent. Uh, against Kern, she outlanded her 96-52, to 52, which is huge, and she has a five inch. She'll be five inches taller than Pahesh in this fight. So that's certainly an advantage the Chinese fighter is going to have. But Vivienne has had a lot of success against taller fighters because she's been fighting the most of her career. She beat uh, Valerie Letourneau in a similar uh, matchup as far as the disparities was concerned there. I think she's going to utilize the clinch here to close that down and really shut down uh, uh, Chinua in this fight. Again, I'm saying that definitely wrong. Uh, I think she's going to grind this fight out. She's going to hang in there with the power punching of her foe. Wait till she slows in a little bit. Her volume will be decent. She might get some takedowns and put Jan on the floor and and uh, control some of the action there. And my prediction is Vivienne Pahey should defeat Jan Chenoa by, I'm going to say by decision for the Brazilian. All right, now we're getting up to a couple more recognizable fighters. Um, that, uh, probably the most recognizable matchup on the... Uh, 
the prelims is in the UFC's welterweight division is Sinsho, An- Sinsho Animal Anzai, 10 wins and 2 losses fighting out of Japan, takes on the Celtic kid Jake Matthews, 13 wins and 3 losses. Now Matthews is 2-0 and uh, since bumping up to welterweight. Uh, he did lose back-to-back fights at lightweight to move him up. The guy's been in the UFC for a while. He's only 23. He's been on the roster for four years. So that's very impressive. He was an Ultimate Fighter Nations, represented Australia against Canada. Uh, I believe he lost, yeah, he lost to... Uh, Olivier Aubin Mercier in his uh, fight on that show. For Anzai, uh, as a pro, he lost his UFC debut, but he's won back to back fights since. One of them was by a fluke hand injury, so it's one of those things where it's like it's a victory, but it's what's it tell us about him? Not much. Uh, Anzai, he's very aggressive, he hits very hard. He can also wrestle when he wants to, but his cardio is a major issue. In his debut, he got absolutely against Alberto Mina, just got exhausted going for it early and got finished. Um, in this fight, and it's, it's worth noting that Matthews, again, he was a big man at lightweight, and that was causing some issues. He's moved to welterweight and looked very good, but in this fight, he's going to be the bigger man again. He's going to be physically larger. Uh, he'll be four inches taller than his opponent. He'll have a three-inch reach advantage. I'd say he's physically the more thickened uh, specimen, and I think that, that's huge. Um, his striking is getting better, but his ground game is still the key to success. And Anzai, you know, for him to win this fight, he needs to make it ugly and overwhelm Matthews, hurt him a couple times, back him off, and just basically put him in a position where he doesn't want to fight anymore. Uh, two of Jake's three losses have come against top level guys in James Vick and Kevin Lee, so there's nothing, no, no shame there. I think Matthews is going to grind him down, use that size, lean on him, push him into the cage, drag him to the mat. He'll have some success with the striking, especially as Anzai slows down, but everything will get easier. And I expect this fight to end on the floor, possibly with uh, Matthews landing strikes or locking up a rear naked choke. My prediction is Jake Matthews to defeat Sinjo Anzai by submission. All right, moving right along. Where are we up to next? Uh, we are in the UFC's welterweight division as Song Kenan, uh, Song the Assassin Kenan, 13 4 0 fighting out of China, will take on Hector El Charo Aldana, undefeated at 4 0. Now, Song debuted, and it was a quick song, uh, pardon the pun, with a 15 second knockout of Bobby Nash. Um, so we didn't get to see much of him at this level. He has five wins by knockout, uh, six submission victories. He's only been out of the round, round one um, five times in 18 pro fights. So that first fight could have gone a long way to telling us what he's capable of at this level. It did not, though. Uh, all five of Song's KO wins have come in his last six victories. So that tells us his striking, both his power and his technical skills to deploy that power have been developing in recent action. For Aldania, he's debuting. He's got four pro fights. He was an ultimate fighter, a tough Latin America two veteran. Uh, his last pro fight was in 2013, and his time on Ultimate Fighter was 2015. So it's 2018, folks. This guy's been incredibly inactive and just not, not out there... Uh, fighting on the pro scene as far as mixed martial arts is concerned, so that is concerning. His striking is serviceable, but not overwhelming, but his takedown defense is a major, major concern. We've seen issues where he gets put on his back and has trouble in that position, and I, I think ultimately Song should win this fight wherever the fight goes. He's more experienced, he's got more punching power, he has a better submission game. You know, he, uh, you know he's, he's shown he can, he can, what he can do and what he's capable of, and uh, my prediction is Song Kennan to defeat Hector Aldana by, or Aldana by, I'll take him by knockout. Um, third, last fight on the prelims. Next, we are in the UFC's, where are we at here? The featherweight division is Rolando Dai. Nine wins, six losses, one draw. Takes on Sugar Shane, Sugar Shane Young of New Zealand with a record, record of 11 wins and four defeats. Uh, Young made his debut against Alexander Volkanovsky, and Volkanovsky is an absolute monster. And Young went the distance with him. He lost a fairly one-sided decision, uh, but he went the distance, and that's damn impressive. Uh, for Dai, he beat his last opponent, um, but he started 0-2 in the UFC and didn't look very good. There were some unfortunate events there. He suffered an eye injury, he lost a point in a fight that probably would have been a draw. So again, it was nice to see him get a victory in a very tough fight. Now, Young can strike and Young can grapple, and that's, that's crucial. You being a well-rounded fighter is key in this day and age. Um, but he hasn't faced a lot of quality opposition, and that's concerning. Uh, he didn't land a lot against Volkanovski because he couldn't stay on his feet long enough to do it. He did what he could, but it just was one of those fights where he was way outmatched, took it on short notice, and that's the best he could come up with. Uh, Dai has a solid striking game. He hits hard. Um, he has held his own even in defeat at times. But And, uh, you know, Young's going to engage him on the feet, but the big thing is Dai has struggled with his takedown defense, and I think the key here is going to be a fairly even match on the, on the, on the mat. Uh, we do see a three-inch reach advantage for Shane Young, but I, or sorry, on the feet they're going to be fairly even, or at least it'll be uh, competitive. I think the key will be when Young shoots in for takedowns, 
and either forces Dye to work hard and zaps his energy or takes him down and keeps him there. And my prediction is Shane Young to defeat Orlando Dye by decision. Uh, this should be a very interesting fight here. Again, in the UFC's Bantamweight division, as Felipe Arantes, 18-9-1 with two no contests, taking on Song Yadong with a record of 10 wins, three losses, and two no contests. Now, Arantes has lost back-to-back fights, um, both by decision, one by split. He did start 2-0 at Bantamweight and started to make a little bit of noise against a, you know, some, some decent competition, uh, but he's looking to get back on track. For Song, he debuted. Uh, he had a first-round win over another debuting fighter, and he's relatively untested. He's, uh, you know, he's got some, but I just think it's a big step up for him against a guy like Arantes. Uh, physically, Arantes has got a six-inch reach advantage. Uh, he did miss weight in his loss to Perez, so I'm questioning how he'll do here, especially fighting on foreign soil. You know, Song hits very hard, but he's still developing, and he has had issues with being put on the mat before, and that's a concern. Arantes, he's the more polished striker. He's the more dangerous fighter. I imagine he can score takedowns. He can also work off his back. We've seen him with a fairly dangerous guard, and I think eventually uh, Yadong's going to just walk. He'll either lose a kickboxing matchup or he'll try and change gears or Arantes will look to exploit it and the fight will hit the ground and Arantes will get him by submission. So my prediction is Felipe Arantes to defeat Song Yadong by submission. And finally, the main event of the prelims, uh, Taruto Ishihara, 11 wins, 5 losses, and 2 draws, taking on Peter No Mercy Yan of Russia, 8 wins and a single defeat. Now, Ishihara's coming off a loss to Jose Quinones. He is one of three of his last four. He's been upset in, in a couple of those fights, and he's really hit a wall after having a very fun start where he was kind of gaining a little bit of notoriety, and now he's kind of stepped back. For Yan, he's coming in a three-fight winning streak, including a fight that I believe was controversial in the reports I read, and he's since avenged it. Uh, he is making his debut. He fought mainly in the ACB organization out of Russia. Now uh, he has three wins by knockout, one submission. When he's four, with the scorecard, so a nice, a fairly nice record for a, a, a still, still develop or still new, relatively newish fighter. Uh, the biggest knock on Ishihara has been his gas tank and takedown defense, which I guess knocks two of them. Uh, neither have held up when he's been beaten. They just seem to fail him, and that's a huge concern. Uh, Jan has solid wrestling, has good striking, and the big thing is he has a solid chin. And that, that's the key here. Is you can fight, if you can force Taruto to go beyond the opening round, he's in serious trouble. And that's what, what we're looking at here. If Taruto can't get him, on, uh, get him out of there early with a knockout, or at least hurt him really bad and compromise him, he's going to struggle here. I think he gets outstruck, spends way too much time on the mat. And my prediction is Peter Jan to defeat Taruto Ishihara by decision. So those are all my preliminary picks for, for UFC Fight Night 132. I'm going to move on to the main card momentarily. Uh, we're going to move now to the main event, or surely the main card of the UFC Fight Night 132 event. I'll be giving you all four of those main card predictions right consecutively here. Similar format we did with the prelims. Again, I'm going to try and see if I can get a bet pack out. The more and more I talk about these fights, I'm kind of like, oh, this would be an interesting bet. I want to you know, I want to get the stuff out there that's in my guys and see what they have to say and see what's available. So, again, it might be a condensed version, but it could be available. If it is, it will be online and, per- and available to purchase by Friday morning. So that'll give you plenty of time if you're going to. I'm going to, be, I'm going to go home and do it tonight if I have that uh, if I have that chance. We'll have to wait and see, okay? Um, by Friday at lunch, we'll say, at the latest. If it's not up by then, it's not going up. Uh, our first fight of the night takes place in the UFC's welterweight division as Li, the leech, Jing Liang, 14-5-0, takes on Japan's Daichi, Daichi Abbey um, with a current record of six wins and one loss. Now, both guys are coming off defeats. Uh, they're relatively – they're good fights, not, you know – Abe kind of lost a controversial close fight, not that, you know, not a robbery, but a fight that he could have won with a little bit more effort. It's the first loss of his career, so he's looking to rebound here. Uh, for Lee, he lost a fight to Jake Matthews that kind of snapped a winning streak that had him making a little bit of noise in the division. Uh, he had won four in a row coming into it. So uh, Lee, he's got a reputation for a grinder, but he's improved as a striker, and he's shown he can knock guys out. He can be, he's dangerous. He can really throw a lot at them. Uh, he lost his last fight because he got knocked down a couple of times, and he really couldn't win the wrestling battles. And that was a big issue. Matthews was having a lot of success just outworking him in a lot of, in a lot of the scenarios. For Abe, I'd say he's the better striker, technically speaking, here. And he's got some good power. Um, the big question is, does he have the defensive wrestling to make it count? I think he does. He's shown some decent takedown defense. And uh, he was a little bit too passive in his last fight, which kind of cost him. And he slowed down a little bit in a very close fight. I thought he won the matchup. But, again, I picked him, so it's kind of a hard, uh, hard situation for me to be biased or to not be biased in. Um, the, the chin of the leech is a huge concern. He's been hurt. He was hurt by Frank Camacho. He was hurt by Jake Matthews. He was hurt by Bobby Nash. He's the type of guy. He slowed down as well in his fight against Keitaro. So he's the type of guy who's he's a, he's he's very good when he's out front, but it's not like he's invulnerable to anything. He can be cracked at any point in time and change the, the complexion of a fight. 
And I think Abe, if those guys can hurt him, Abe can as well. Lee, again, he's a little bit too aggressive at times. He can counter. And Abe can counter strike. And I think he's going to catch him coming in. I think uh, uh, Jing Liang's going to going to push forward too much, and eventually Abe's going to counter. And my prediction is Lee Jing, or sorry, um, Daichi Abe to defeat Lee Jing Liang by knockout. Uh, our next fight on the main card is it takes place in the women's strawweight division. It's the ninth ranked Jessica Rose Clark, or Jessie Jess, as, they, as she's been referred to. No, eight wins, four losses, and one no contest. Takes on the tenth ranked Jessica Evil Eye, uh, with a current record of 12 wins, six losses, and n- one no contest. Now, I just snapped a four fight uh, losing streak. Uh, it's a big divisional debut for her, uh, and that was huge. Um, to get back, it was a split decision. But again, she gets in a new division. She gets a win. She gets, it's almost like she gets a new lease on life, um, and we'll see how she can manage that going that forward. Clark's already two and zero in this division, so she knows the win here. She's already ninth in the division. Um, a win here really puts her up into the conversation with three victories in a relatively, uh, you know, fresh grouping of of, of girls. Uh, and she's beaten some good names: Beck Rawlings and Paige Van Zander. No, there's no nobody to sneeze at there. The PV there, there were close fights, but again, she did enough to get the victory. And I, she's Jessica. I is known for having close fights. She's only landed, you know, she's only landed more strikes than her opponent twice. One against Leslie Smith, in which she hurt her, just blew her out of the water there. And then uh, she landed three more than Betch Kohade in a fight that she easily could have won and just shit the bed, as far as I'm concerned. Um, when, in her last fight, though, Jessica, I she had to go to her takedowns against Faria, which is concerning. She had success with it. That's also even her downfall uh, when she was fighting at bantamweight. Uh, she has given up at least one takedown in four of her six defeats, and most usually it's two or three takedowns, and, and they're a major cause for concern when her opponent starts to flow and put her on the on the mat. Clark, she has a solid striking game. She's got some hard kicks, and she can do some damage in the clinch and work there, but she can also look for takedowns. I think that's a big part of her success, what we could see here. She landed two each against Rawlings and Page, and they add to her decent volume. 101 significant strikes against uh, Beck Rawlings, and that's something I we haven't really seen I put up that type of volume. Uh, 55 against Paige Van Zandt, also respectable. And I think you combine it somewhere in the in between there, between 60, 65 and 85 strikes, and a couple of landed takedowns with some clinch control, and that's a recipe for success here. Again, I think Clark is known for close fights. I think she'll be more active than I, and Jessica seems just like she's not fighting well. She doesn't have a lot of – she's got, coming off that win, but it just hasn't been a good run for her. And my prediction is Jessica Rose Clark to defeat Jessica I by decision. Uh, co-main event of the evening, this one looks like a – very fun fight as uh, the, in the light heavyweight division, 7th ranked and former interim title challenger, Ovin St. Prue, 22-11-0, takes on the 13th ranked Tyson Pedro, 7 wins and a single loss fighting out of Australia. Now, both men have, have recent losses to Ilir Latifi, OSP, so they, they fought some common, common opponents. Uh, OSP is trying to stay near the top of the division. He's floundering. He's almost making take, taking a step back in his overall skill and capability, but he's trying to hold on. For Pedro, he's working his way up there. OSP, you know, he's he's he comes off to me as a guy who's a big, clumsy bruiser that has had absolute flashes of brilliance. His blonde flu chokes are impressive, but he's just <coughs> – pardon me. I'm a little bit sick too. He's just that type of guy who he just – he's not smooth when he does things. He throws a kick and he stutter steps with his, with his plant foot or his pivot foot because it's just it's awkward when he throws it and you know it just it prevents him from going to that next level for Pedro he's a, he's a capable wrestler he's got serviceable striking and he's trying to and he's a very very good grappler and he's trying to put it all together uh with Tyson Pedro he's only been out of the round round one once and it was that loss to Latifi and uh that's a big issue against a veteran guy like OSP who knows how to get that fight pardon me knows how to get out of round one and then should know against a guy who might start to flounder how to grind him out in rounds two and three. And that you have to wonder if that's what OSP is looking at. But you have to, on the flip side, OSP doesn't have a great gas tank. He's not known for a type of guy who can go three rounds without a drop off in performance. Um, it is worth noting three of his last four wins have come beyond the first round. Is that something he can, he can reproduce here? It's probably in his best interest. Um, he tends to be a very strong starter. And that could be enough to get Pedro out of his comfort zone, force him into rounds two and three. But again, how much did, did fighting Latifi improve Tyson Pedro? He looked good in his last fight, which was a victory. It didn't go beyond the first round, but still, it's that experience you gain. Uh, Pedro is a finisher. OSP has been finishing three of his last five losses, twice by submission. I think St. Prue's a bit of a front runner. He tends to take advantage of vulnerabilities his opponent has to offer. Um, and that's with a grappling defense, they're older guys, whatever. And, you know, Pedro's biggest, the biggest gap in Pedro's game is his lack of, uh, 
long fight experience, but that's not something OSP can can play to and can count on and say, hey, I'm going to push him in round one, and then I'm going to take it over in rounds two and three. No, OSP pushes him in round one. He's liable to get taken over in rounds two and three by gassing out. Um, both men are very big men. This is a fight I actually really want to see, and I'm going to try and watch it where I'm, I am going to be this week. Um, Pedro could hurt him and, and finish him, like we saw uh, in one of his more recent fights, the name, you know, the, uh, shoot, the Bear Jew. I believe his, name, his uh, nickname is this. His first name is his name's escaping me. Uh, either way, or he could take him to the mat and submit him at some point because we've seen Ovin St. Pru some vulnerabilities in the ground. Uh, but my prediction is Tyson Pedro to defeat Ovin St. Pru by TKO. And now we move to the main event of the evening in the UFC's welterweight division as the 11th ranked Donald Cowboy Cerrone, 33 10 0 with one no contest, takes on the 13th ranked Rocky Leon Edwards, uh, 14 wins and three losses. Now, big question with Donald Cerrone is where is he at? One of the things I hate most about Cerrone is he'll fight anybody anywhere. I like and hate it at the same time. I like the fact that he's that willing to fight. I hate the fact that he's just like, yeah, give me an opponent. Now, I like guys who say, give me an opponent, but I'm going to prepare. He's one of these guys, like when he fought Jorge Masvidal. I don't know who this guy is. I've never heard of him in my life. You haven't heard of Jorge Masvidal? What the fuck are you doing? You're not fighting at the top level then. If you're, you know, you're fighting at the top level. But you're, not, you're not a student of the game. I want opponents who will fight anybody anywhere, but give me some time to prepare. Let, give me, you know, I'm going to study him. I'm going to figure it out. I'm going to go out and beat him because I'm going to fight smart. And that's been one of his issues. He was just fighting anybody, anywhere, and getting beaten. He did beat Yancey Medeiros, which was impressive. That was kind of one of those fights where it's like, is Cerrone done? If he loses this fight, he is done. He won it in impressive fashion. Uh, and the guys he's losing to, top competition, Masvidal, uh, Darren Till, obviously showing how effective he is right now, and former champion Robbie Lawler. But, you know, Leon Edwards is really coming on. And he's not a big name yet. He's ranked. Oh, but you look at the guys he's fought. He submitted Albert, Albert Tumanoff. Tumano, impressive. Decision victory over Vincente Luque. Impressive. Um, Brian Barberini's a tough nut. He beat him as well. He knocked out uh, Peter Sabota, who's a guy who's come a long way. These are all solid victories. His only recent loss of value, Cameron Usman, who's on the verge of um, being one of those top guys in the division. So, again, Leon Edwards, not a big name, which is dangerous for Cowboy. You lose this fight, suddenly he's lost another fighter who's turning him into a stepping stone. But... You know, Cerrone, and, and, but I, I like what I've seen out of Edwards. He's, his progression's been impressive. Uh, for Cerrone, his chin and body are both major areas of concerns. And, you know, can Edwards exploit this? He's not a, a bomber. He showed against Seth Pazinski. He does have knockout power. Can he bring that to bear against Cowboy? I don't know. Um, Edwards has shown he can slow down in fights and longer fights. And Cerrone, you know, he has finished his last six opponents and then not had to go, in the last six vi- wins and not had to go deep. But he's got decent cardio. And, in fact, Edwards is a good starter. Cerrone tends to be a bit of a slow starter. And that's concerning. Um, against RDA and Till, they both took him out in round one. Masvidal destroyed him in round one, finished him off in round two. The fight should have been ended up before the five-minute mark. So Cerrone needs to get out of that opening five to ten minutes before he should feel comfortable here. Uh, Cerrone's aggression and combination of striking this is what makes him great. Leg kicks, knee strikes, quick hands overall, and some of the ways he, like the combination he took out uh, Rick Story with, how he finished Matt Brown, very impressive. Um, he has struggled, though, with skilled boxers and skilled strikers, and Edwards, I think, is going to give him some trouble here. Edwards can hold his own, I think, early, keep it technical, take advantage of the lack of Cerrone defense. You know, he keeps his he stands tall, keeps his head up on a post and, re- and ready to be hit. I think it's right there to be hit. Edwards' wrestling is improving. He's landed 12 takedowns over his last five fights. That's an avenue he could look to exploit. Again, Cowboy's a fantastic grappler and somebody you don't want to really tangle with too much on the mat. But Edwards, I think Edwards could look to take him down, especially in the later stages of this fight if it gets there. I don't anticipate it's going to. Again, Cerrone seems right now to be beating guys on their way down and losing to guys on their way up. Maybe the Madero's fight bucks that trend. I think Edwards is on his way up. So my prediction is Leon Edwards to defeat Donald Cerrone by TK. Oh, so those are all my predictions, and I believe that's 13 in total for UFC Fight Night 132 preliminary predictions and main card predictions. Again, head over to my website and check it out just to make sure I haven't posted a bet back. I'm, I'm more and more I think about it. If I can get all my things done tonight, I need to get done. I'm going to try my best to do an abbreviated bet pack to just still give you the value, maybe not as in-depth breakdowns for this entire fight card. We'll see how that plays out. If I don't, Obviously, I will hook you up, the subscribers, with the Ultimate Fighter Finale one as part of the, to finish out your subscription pack. So, uh, again, this looks like a good card. I wanted to do it because I know after this one, I want, I'm still in search of 300 victories in a year. And I know that we get two weeks off after this one, so I wanted to make sure I was involved here. So, again, it should be fun, should be exciting. Um, again, guys, enjoy. If you're going to get up that early, if not, you catch it on Fight Pass later on. I probably will wake up in time to watch the uh, last bit of the prelims and the main card. Um, but uh, that's it for me, guys. I'll talk to you soon. Take care.
Hej.